Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Devin. I'm the communications manager here at Boldly, and we are going live today with Jeremy Burroughs. I'm so excited to have him on as a guest. Hi, Jeremy, and welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who don't know about Jeremy, let me just share you share with you a short little bio, and then I'm going to let him really introduce himself. Um, so Jeremy, I first came across him about a year ago when he did. Um, so Jeremy is an owner of a podcast. He's also an author. And the podcast is called The Leader Assistant. And our CEO was a guest on his podcast. And that's when I first heard of him. I've been following him for a while. He had no idea I existed. <laughs> I reached out to him about a month ago and asked if we could connect. And he jumped right on. So I'm so really grateful that he's here today. Um, I have his book, actually. If you guys, um, we're going to talk a little bit about this book today, The Leader Assistant book. And it's just a really great book for assistants and executives, leaders. I feel like everybody, honestly, can benefit from this book. Anybody who is in a position where they are working to help other people. Uh, so in addition to this, uh, Jeremy, of course, he's an experienced executive assistant. He would have to be, hopefully, to write that book. <laughs> and he is the owner of GoBurrows.com, LeaderAssistant.com, and TipsForAssistant.com. And if that wasn't enough, he's also a father of two sons. So Jeremy's, you know, got a lot to go going on for him. And he's going to share about all of his stuff with us. So Jeremy, can you share just a little bit about your background and what led you to launching GoBurrows, the leader assistant? Yeah, thanks, uh, Devin. I appreciate it. And hello, everyone. Happy Tuesday, July 13th. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I've been an executive assistant for this is my 16th year. Um, so I love the profession. I'm currently executive assistant to the CEO of a support automation software company called Capacity, uh, and they're headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri, but I just recently moved back to my hometown of Kansas City, Missouri, so I work 100% uh, remote now um, with my executive who is in St. Louis. So I've been an assistant 16 years. Um, yeah, I started blogging in 2016 um, to help executives and their assistants accomplish more, um, lead better, and resist burnout. And a couple of years ago, I decided to launch the podcast, the Leader Assistant Podcast. And then a year ago, I published uh, the book, The Leader Assistant. And so really the, the start of it was 2016 when I started writing blogs and reaching out to people on LinkedIn. And the reason I started it is my, I burned out in my last role, my, my last executive burned out, and he actually got fired. Um, and it's partly just because of dumb things he did um, while he was burning out. And I decided to resign and move on. And I just kind of took some time off and hit reset on life. And I decided, you know what? I don't want this to happen to me again. I don't want this to happen to other executives and I don't want this to happen to other assistants. So I'm just going to help as many executives and assistants um, as I can really avoid making the same mistakes that I made. So that's why I started the blog. That's ultimately why I started the podcast and wrote the book. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the short version. Yeah, I like that story. I, I wasn't aware of all that. And I'm so glad that you talk about burnout because we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to ask you some questions and pick your brain about that as well. It's a big piece of your book. And I think it's really important. And I'm really glad that you're remote right now, too, because most of our audience is remote. So you'll be able to speak to that side of things. So um, in your book, you have four pillars that you, you know, the book is breaking down really beautifully into just four succinct pillars. And that first one is the essential characteristics for executive assistants. Now, I think a lot of times when we think about executive assistants or you know, any type of assistant, really, it's one of those that people don't realize how difficult the job actually is until they're in it every day. And, and you're managing schedules for multiple people and, and coordinating things and not wanting anything to drop through the cracks. And so you're making all of these decisions and you're doing them on behalf of other people. And that's that's a lot. So we talk about these essential characteristics. And then um, in the next piece, you talk a little bit about, well, a lot actually, about five very specific 
what you call game changing characteristics. And so I, I like to think of it as like the base and then the extra five that you need to really level up your game to step up. And uh, so those are the discerning, steady, confident, humble, and future proof. But my question for you is why did you choose these five? What makes them the, the game changing characteristics? Yeah, I mean, uh, great question. So I basically looked at what it was, well, step back. Instead of thinking, all right, how can I write a book about assistance and how to be a better assistant? I more thought of it like, how can I write a book about leadership and, and how to be a better leader? Um, because I was kind of, frankly, tired of all of this education for assistance that was all kind of almost treated the assistant role as if it was it was different or um and almost like unintentionally people were treating it like they were trying to say they wanted other people not to treat it like uh and it was just this different role with a different thing and i'm like no it's a it's a you're a shadow you're the shadow to your executive and you run the business um you you know more than most people in the company um you even know more than the executive at times and so this is more of a you know we're leaders we're leaders and so how can i help people be leaders and the reason i picked those five characteristics is because those are the five characteristics that i most often see in leaders um in game changers and i use an analogy of um baseball because I love baseball. I'm from Kansas City. I'm a big Kansas City Royals fan. And I I love the outfield. I love watching um, outfielders just run forever and dive and go full out or save a home run, jump over the fence and bang into the bang into the fence. And I talk about this in the book, but basically there's an outfielder named Lorenzo Kane who was uh, in his prime of when he was with the Royals uh, during our World Series back-to-back -back World Series run in 2014 and 2015. And it was interesting because I started looking, I was like, okay, this, this guy's really good, but why is he game-changing? Like, what makes him a game-changer? And, you know, I was like, okay, well, he's fast, but there are a lot of athletes that are fast. Um, he is, you know, he can throw the ball accurately. He can catch the ball. What, what is it though? And I started trying to wrestle with, all right, what is it that makes people game changing? And then looked it in the professional setting, of course. And that's why, that's where I picked discerning. So discerning, I'll do a really quick overview. So discerning um, is not just about knowing the right decision and making the right decisions on behalf of your executive or your team. It's also knowing um, the right problems that are worth solving. So my executive likes to say, you know, I would rather have someone that finds solutions to the right problems or sorry, finds solutions that don't work <laughs> um, to the, but, but he's, but they're focused on the right problem versus finding people that figure out and solve problems that don't matter. Um, and so that's where I talk about discerning and then steady, you know, go back to the baseball example when it's, the crowd's roaring and you're on first base and you're down by one or, or you're tied in the eighth inning of a playoff game and you're on first base with one out and you're basically focused and you have to stay steady. You can't, it doesn't mean you're not, your adrenaline's not pumping. It doesn't mean you're not nervous. It doesn't mean that you feel like you could just like, you're like sweating like a pig. Like, it doesn't mean that you're kind of on edge, but what it means is that you can still execute under pressure. You can, you can stay steady enough to have that intense ex execution. Um, and so that's an example of, of steady, but then confident and humble, um, you know, confident, not like a self-helpy, you know, I'm strong, I'm brave, confident, because then if you, are weak that day that that deteriorates that confidence because it was based on a statement that ended up not being true that day 
And so I'm talking about more of the deep rooted confidence I talk about in the book, um, like an unwavering belief that you have what it takes, but also a grace for yourself if you don't do well that day. Um, and basically remembering that you're a valuable human being no matter what happens that day. Um, that's a deep rooted confidence. And then humility, uh, thinking of yourself less, not thinking less of yourself. Um, and then future proof, this is the this is kind of a big hot topic among you know not just assistants but you know AI and robots taking over our jobs taking over the world whatever um, I talk about embracing automation um, you know and I work at Capacity which is a support automation platform um, but yeah embracing automation but then also cultivating your emotional intelligence and so I see all of these things where I look at executives and I look at leaders like you know, uh, famous historical leaders or, you know, Jeff Bezos at Amazon or, you know, all these different people that have just crazy, fast paced, um, successful entrepreneur or business people. Um, they, they exhibit these, these characteristics. Uh, they're discerning, they're steady, they're confident, they're humble, they're future proof. They embrace automation and they know what it means to, cultivate emotional intelligence. Um, so anyway, that's what that's a long, long version of why I chose those five. Um, and I think that, you know, I chose to focus on those because again, this isn't just a standard assistant book. It's more of a leadership book. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting now that you phrase it that way, because when I was reading the book, that's why I said early on that I feel like this book could go for so many people. It's mm -hmm. even though it's geared towards executive assistants, I feel like so many people could really benefit from this book. And that makes complete sense after hearing that you've you've really focused on being a leader in, in that space. Mm -hmm. um, while you were chatting here, we had a question come through. And if anybody else out there has questions, please put them in the chat um, or in the comment section where we'll get to those as we go and make sure we get to all of them by the end. But um, this person said, I love the concept behind your book. As an assistant, do you have any tips for evaluating yourself for those game changer characteristics, measuring how you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I go through this a little bit in the book. I actually have some self-assessment questions at the end of each chapter for those characteristics to kind of help you wrestle with the root behind maybe why you're not steady um, or the root behind why you lack confidence. And so hopefully those are helpful there at the end of each chapter on that, on that characteristic section. Uh, but I will say <clears throat> it, the more that you can do two things, the two biggest things are one, detach your worth from your work. Uh, and that's the only way that you'll be able to really free yourself to lead and uh, level up in these ways is if you detach your worth as a human being from your work, meaning how well or how poorly you pr produce that day or that week and what people say or don't say about you, you detach your worth from all that, that will free you to do that. And the second thing is, um, if your goals, well, say it differently, differently, your goals in your role should be the same, essentially the same as your executive's goals. So, you, you know, you should go to your executive, your goals are my goals. So I, I don't, I know a lot of assistants, we, we, we try, we get to our performance reviews or we're trying to evaluate how we're doing and we try to think, oh, well, what goals do we have? Whatever. Like, our goals should be their goals. So my executive's goals are he wants to stay healthy, stay married and stay in business. Those are his three ultimate high level goals. So what are my goals as an assistant? Everything that I do day in and day out is going to align with one of those things, you know, stay healthy. Is he, is he, is his, am I canceling his workouts for some meeting that I shouldn't, that I didn't need to? Am I making sure that he's got, um, you know, healthy lunch options? You know, stay married. Am I making sure that he's, you know, showing up to uh, his counseling sessions with his wife or whatever, you know, like those, those types of things or making sure that he's home in time to take the kids to baseball, um, you know, things like that just to, to help him balance. And then third, stay in business. Okay. Well, is he, is there a big sales meeting that I need to move everything so that he can fit in? Is he got to meet with an investor? Um, 
everything I do, I'm filtering through those lenses to make sure that those three goals of his, um, I'm able to support him in. So as you're kind of measuring how you're doing and evaluating yourself, use the questions at the end of the chapters. Um, remember to detach your worth from your work and then just align your goals with your executive's goals. And then you don't have to get so in the nitty gritty of, well, am I being confident enough? And am I being humble enough? Am I being steady enough? You just know that you're not taking things personally and you've got some solid ground that you're standing on and that the work that you're doing is driving towards your executive and your company's goals. So hopefully like, that's helpful, Katie. Good question. Yeah, I like how you mentioned speaking about, you speak on their goals and aligning yourself to help them with their goals because sometimes it's, you know, we think about what our goals are and what we want to do um, to make them, you know, to get to help them achieve their goals. But maybe it's it's first it's starting at the top and then trickling down in terms of what is it that we really want to achieve to level up. When you mentioned those, um, I'm so glad you brought them up, by the way, because they're one of my favorite parts of your book. When you mentioned those questions, I just want to show here. I'm not going to show the whole book, but let's see if I can get it in the camera. So at the end, he has these questions here. And these self-reflection questions are, if you're the kind of person that likes to do self-assessments or really just like think about yourself and improve yourself, these questions are, they really make you think deeply. And I'm just going to read one of them so that you can go on your free time and go look at the others. But uh, what helps me be steady when things around me fall apart? That, and that's just the first one that I opened to that I happen to read. It's not that it's my favorite or anything. I love all of these. Um, so that is a great tool. I'm glad that you brought that up because I hadn't um, mentioned that before. Yeah. Too bad we don't have like, we need, we, we need like a, a self-assessment that we can just take like a quiz, but then sometimes that's really hard because. Yeah, I, I, I thought about, I've thought about that. And you know, those things are helpful. The personalities tests and the, the Enneagram and the strengths finders and all those different things are, they can be helpful. Um, but a lot, oftentimes that really, depending on the type of person you are, you get kind of stuck like over analyzing. And so I like to kind of take a step back and think, all right, what are the company's goals? What are, what are the executive's goals? And I'm just gonna, you know, focus my role on helping them with those things. I like your approach because it's more personalized. I think that that works better. Um, okay, so we talked about pillar one being the characteristics, and then pillar two, um, where we uh, we have not talked about yet. So let's move about move into pillar two, which is um, we talk about tactics. And you say, and I and I jotted this down so I could say it word for word. Leader assistants employ the right tactics to solve the right problem at the right time. Okay, if that doesn't give you like some sort of chills, I don't know what will because that to me, and when I read that, it not only does it give me chills, it like beats me up and gives me empowerment. Just reading that statement at, without even delving into the tactics. But one of the tactics you talk about that I really want to focus on today, it, especially with last year and COVID and so many people working remotely now is um, the interruption piece. So you talk about interrupting and staying on task. And I'd like to just ask you if you have any tips for ways that you can manage those interruptions and really stay on task when you're working at the house and your family's around. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I'll say three things. One, communicate with your family, your partner, your, you know, kids, like, hey, you know, this is not this is not daddy ignoring you time. This is daddy focusing on work time so that he has more time for you later. Um, so communicating with them so that you don't feel guilty when, when you're like, Hey, I can't talk right now. I got to focus, whatever. But also so they, they understand and they learn to respect those boundaries and respect your time. Uh, second thing would be always have a process for assimilating your interruptions. So it's not about, you're never going to be able to avoid interruptions completely. Um, so you, you have to have a system to assimilate them. So for example, if somebody pings me on Slack and I, I see it come through and it's not urgent, uh, which most of the time it's not, um, then I will just hit remind me in an hour or remind me tomorrow morning or remind me in 20 minutes it, based on, you know, 
the timeline of when that thing needs to be take, take care of. Uh, there's also ways you can just, through Slack, you can like email yourself a Slack message. There's different plugins you can do if you use Slack. Um, sometimes it's just a post-it note, and if somebody interrupts you, you just write it on a post-it note, and then you, you keep going. Uh, but my favorite trick is, will you please send me an email so I don't forget? And then, <laughs> and then I put it in their hands, and then they either don't send me an email because they figure it out on their own, or they send me an email, and then it's in my list later um, to come back to that, but I'm not having to leave the project that I'm working on. Um, and then let's see, the third thing would be, so let's see, communicating with your family, having a system to assimilate interruptions. Um, and then I would just say focus blocks or time blocks. Um, so have time, maybe you log in an hour earlier than your executive does, or maybe you just say, hey, I'm going to turn off my notifications from 4 to 5 p.m. every day or 3 to 5 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and I'm just going to crank out my email and crank out my to-do list, and then I'll get back to you uh, in the morning. Or I'll check in from 5 to 5.30 to make sure there's no, no urgent needs or whatever. Um, but basically time blocking, or, or I, I call it the ideal week in the book, um, doing it for our executives, but we should do it for ourselves mm -hmm. as well. Um, otherwise, you literally just open your computer and you're just like, you just stare at it. You're like, okay, I've got so much to do. I don't know where to start. Whereas if you can do, and you've got interruptions coming in, Whereas if you have a focus block, you can just, um, I'm not going to open up my Slack or I'm going to turn off all my notifications and I'm not going to schedule any meetings and calls and I'm just going to go step-by-step step through my to-do list and get it done. Okay. I, first of all, please don't judge me here. I've been using Slack for over four years and I had no idea that you could set a thing to remind you again in a few minutes. <laughs> well, there you go. You learn something every day. I'm like, I, I can't believe I didn't know that because I use it on a, I mean, I have it pulled up right here. I have it, I use it on a daily basis. And I they even have, that. they even have a, a schedule feature that they're rolling out. It's, I don't think it's rolled out completely yet, but it's coming soon where you can actually schedule send a message. So if you want to send somebody a message and you're, you remembered to do it at nine o'clock at night, you can go ahead and go in, type the message and then hit schedule to send it the next morning. So you don't interrupt each other. And so we try to, my CEO is trying to communicate like, hey, listen, instead of me, because when he has an idea, he has to get it out of his head. So instead of him just like, you know, noon on a Saturday, pinging somebody, he'll, he'll go ahead and get it out of his head, but he'll schedule it for Monday morning to send. Oh, I like that. I just saw today that we have it here at Boldly now on our Boldly Slack. It, it, just today we got oh, it. Nice. I need to refresh ours just to see if we got it too. See if it came through. Yeah, because I'm the kind of person that wakes up really early before everybody else in the universe. And I'm on the Eastern Coast and we've got team members on the Pacific Coast. So I, uh, you know, don't want to ping them at 6 a.m. my time and <laughs> being able to set that. Because what will happen is I'll say, oh, I'm going to just wait until they're up and awake and, and then like, busy. yeah so exactly that's great yeah okay. it's nice to it's nice to be able to have it both ways so like it's not just oh please don't ping me at this time because people on that side can turn off their notifications if they want and then on the other hand it's like well i don't want to have to wait until a certain time because i'm my schedule's different and i work differently and so this these tools that we have allow us to work the best way we work, but also respect the, the schedules and the, the way other people work. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I also really like how you mentioned, um, sometimes you have so many decisions to make that you can't figure out where to start because I say that all the time, <laughs> even just like something simple. My husband will be like, what do you want for dinner? And I'm like, oh, I've made so many decisions today. I don't even know where to start with dinner. Just let's not think about that. Yeah, decision yeah. fatigue. Yes, yes, that was a big piece of your book when we talk about burnout. I that one really hit home for me there with that. Yeah. Um, so, but before we talk about burnout, we go to pillar three, right? Which is you talk about communication and relationships. And um, for the person who's already supporting an executive and they want to build that relationship, make it a little bit stronger, do you have any recommendations for them? 
I mean, I don't, I don't, want, I don't have time to go into too much, but I would encourage you to look at the chapter about um, your executive uh, in that pillar. And there are questions. I have a list of questions that you can ask. Um, the first one, the, the, the one that I'll share is um, what's keeping you up at night? And so basically the idea is you're trying to get at what they're worried about, what they're concerned about, to make sure that you know their priorities and you're aligned with it as you're organizing their schedule and um, trying to make decisions on their behalf. Um, so anyway, I think the best way to, to really improve your relationship is ask better questions. And I try to provide several in the book that you can ask um, periodically to really help you anticipate their needs and um, learn to work with them better. Okay. I, I like that you give the examples of the questions because I'm going to be using them. So <laughs> Sandra may have read your book and she'll be like, you pulled that from Jeremy. There you go. <laughs> uh, we got a couple of comments here. It doesn't look like we have any questions, but um, Sherry said, I love scheduled sends. Uh, she uses it for her email, but having it for Slack will be great, especially with the time zone differences. Definitely. Yeah. And then uh, Katie also chimed in. She uses this feature on Gmail. Excited to see this is coming for Slack too. See, now I feel even like more crazy that everybody well, uses all these things that I'm not. <laughs> what's funny is people are like, oh, you know, we don't email, we Slack. Like we just use Slack so we don't need email. And you'll notice that the more and more features Slack comes out with, the more it's looking more and more like email. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my theory is that Slack is gonna turn into email, basically. It's gonna basically feel like your Gmail inbox. But anyways, it already kind of feels like that. I, I like to use Slack for like quick things and then email for things that I need to put thought into and, and yeah. come back to and really spend time on. Um, all right, so that's great. I, I appreciate you sharing about that, building the relationship with your um, <laughs> Some people have really strong relationships already, but I know that there's some people out there who would love to take their relationship just up a notch. And um, so the last pillar we touched on a couple times already, and that is burnout and um, really taking care of yourself as the key to long-term sustainability. So I also said earlier that being an executive assistant is a lot more difficult than I think what people realize because there's so many decisions that come with that that you have to make on behalf of other people. And it's really having all of your ducks in a row all the time uh, as best as you can and so people are 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 um in this field i think if they don't take care of themselves they're more susceptible to being burned out because they are not only making decisions for themselves but they're doing it for someone else as well as well and there's a lot of weight that comes with that so um in your book what antidotes to burnout um you talk, you talk about antidotes to burnout what which ones do you have any that are your favorite are they all equally important who are they for are they for everyone are they just for those who are experiencing extra stress those who are close to burnout what's the ideal person to use these antidotes i mean i think everyone experiences burnout to some extent it's just a matter of how much damage it's going to cause um so I used to say avoid burnout, but now I say resist burnout because I honestly don't think that anyone can actually completely avoid it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and again, there's different levels and different extremities of uh, damage that it can do on people. Uh, burnout can um, literally, um, literally kill people um, with stress and illnesses and depression and suicide. Um, um, or it can destroy relationships, it can destroy careers, um, or it can simply, you know, give you a headache every couple of weeks. You know, there's different different levels. Um, but my favorite antidote is probably uh, defining boundaries with your executive. So my last executive, we did not define boundaries. Um, we were always pinging each other all during vacation. We didn't really take va real vacations. Um, didn't even take real days off and looking back in hindsight, I'm like, no wonder we burned out. Um, but defining boundaries with my current executive is like, Hey, you know, listen, I said, um, I am going to work my rear end off and I'm going to be the best assistant you've ever had. Um, but I also ask you to just leave me alone on the weekends unless it's an urgent, urgent. And, uh, 
so he's like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of kind of not having good healthy boundaries either. So I'm going to have a 24 hour straight Sabbath every weekend where I don't have Slack I open. I don't open email. Um, it's at least 24 hours straight, usually more, but so like maybe Saturday at noon to Sunday at noon or Saturday at five to Sunday at five, absolutely no email, no Slack. Um, and so anyway, that's been a huge, huge thing. I mean, I can go on vacation and not worry about him calling and texting me. I can go take a day off or, you know, I'm not sitting around or hanging out taking my boys to the park on Sunday, worried that like checking my phone every two minutes, worried that he's going to ping me and really need something. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, boundaries is the biggest antidote to burnout, but, um, I will say real quickly though, finding a hobby is also really key because if you don't have a hobby, something to do creatively and, and, and engage your, um, you know, stimulate your mind and engage your creativity, uh, outside of work, then you're going to end up, just wanting to work um, because you want, you need to do something, you know, you need to do something with your hands uh, mm -hmm. or your brain uh, over the weekend. Otherwise you're just going to do mind numbing Netflix binges and actually not refresh yourself and, and restore yourself. So. Yeah. I I'm so glad that you touch on that in your book because for multiple reasons. So in my past life, I actually taught stress management education, to service members that was my job and that's all i did and we used to talk about how stress really can affect every single system in your body and how most people don't take the time to prevent stress from happening or they don't have healthy ways to cope with it and they wait till it gets really bad and then the situation is a whole lot worse and um i think that the boundaries piece is just really great because especially for new assistants new assistants who are out there and they want to just like take on everything right away and say yes 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 and then you know, two years down the line, you're burned out, you're exhausted because you didn't create those healthy boundaries early on. And in the long run, you end up not working as efficiently as you could, and you may even long leave the job before you would normally. So in the long run, you're not really helping yourself or your executive by not creating those healthy boundaries. So I think that's important. Um, and you talked earlier, you mentioned that decision fatigue, and I think everybody needs to, to read the section on decision fatigue, because I know I cannot be the only one that's like, <laughs> decide where we're going on vacation or what we're doing for dinner, because I've made decisions all day long. So uh, just reducing those decisions that you take, make, you talk even about um, planning, like what you're going to wear ahead of time and things like that, just little bitty decisions. And when I read that, I felt like I had been heard. I'm going to be completely honest because just little decisions are the ones that drive me nuts. Yeah. I, when I say that out loud, I feel like people think I'm crazy. Like we're planning a vacation right now. People want to know what I want to do. And I'm like, I don't want to make the decision on what we do. Somebody else do that. Uh, so I um, appreciate that, that piece. Definitely. Yeah. It's a big part of our lives making decisions and we just don't realize it. And then we get, yeah, we, we log off for vacation and then you realize you're like, wait, some of us, some of us, when we take a vacation, we don't want to make any decisions. We just want to go along for the ride. Others of us, we don't get that influence in our role or in our home life. So we're like, when we get to vacation, we're like, we want to plan everything. <laughs> we want to make the decision and we want to make sure it's all planned out. So anyway, yeah, I need one of those people to come with me because I don't want to. Exactly. Do <laughs> as long as I have good food and a good place to sleep, that's all that matters. There you go. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for joining us today. Um, for anyone who is interested in learning more about what you're up to, where should they go? Should just all three websites or is there one that you like to direct people to? Yeah, just go, just go to leaderassistant.com. Um, it'll it technically is redirected to goburrows.com, but it's just easier to to spell and say leaderassistant.com. Uh, but also check out my book, uh, ping me on LinkedIn. I'd love to love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Uh, my book on Amazon, the ebook is actually on sale this month. It's only $1.99. So you can get Dang. the Amazon Kindle ebook for $1.99 this month. I think they're going to keep it up all month, but Amazon does whatever they want. So it could change any, any day. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, that's the full book, the ebook, and you don't need a Kindle device. You can read it on the Kindle app on your desktop or on your iPhone or on your Android or whatever. So 
love for you to um, connect, say hi, and yeah, check out the book. Okay, yeah, that's a good deal for sure. So can't beat that. Two dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, for everybody who's listening, I will link everything in the comment section when this is done. I'll link the. Um, the site to get in touch with him. I'm also going to go ahead and link the podcast episode where you uh, spoke with C our CEO and founder, Sandra yeah. Lewis. That's just that such a great episode. Yeah, it was a fun conversation. Yeah. Um, so I was listening to it the other day and just so I could refresh my mind. And for those who are interested in, in watching it, some of the things that they cover are just, uh, they talk about interviewing tips when you're interviewing um, as an assistant and then um, culture, finding like a right culture fit and then transitioning as an executive assistant uh, from in office to remote work. So if that's something that you've done in this past year, or maybe you're looking at coming up, it's a really great episode to tune into and check out. So Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, everyone. Thank you for the questions that we had. I hope you guys all have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Devin. All right. Bye.